The Chair of Chemical Engineering, Mario Ioannidis, had the opportunity to talk about the unconventional beginnings of the University of Waterloo and the Department of Chemical Engineering with Professor Emeritus Louis Bodner. Okay. We're here at the uh, beautiful home of Professor Louis Bodner, former professor of chemical engineering at the University of Waterloo. Louis, I'm holding a history of the origins of our department, which I think it coincides with the origin of the University of Waterloo. And I would like you to tell us something about uh, your part in this, in this story. Okay. Well, I came to Waterloo from the University of Texas in 1960, and uh, the first graduates that Waterloo had were masters in mathematics, because shortly after Waterloo started, Ralph Stanton came from the University of Toronto, and he brought some of his graduate students with him, and so the first graduates were Masters in Mathematics. Louis, some people describe the founding of the University of Waterloo as unconventional. How did chemical engineering come into being at Waterloo? Um, I'm trying to remember the names of the head of chemical engineering. There were two people. Ted Bakke. Ted Bakke and Jim Ford. That's right. There were two of them. And Ted actually went on to higher administrative jobs. So, um, so how did how did all you know come into being? You know, for, you found you found uh, chemical engineering. I didn't under, find you. No. Or they found you. They yeah. Chemical engineering was going when chemical engineering I think was the first building built. The yeah now called Douglas Wright Engineering, uh, and previously Engineering One. Yes. And it's still there. And it's still there. You started as a professor of chemistry at RMC, is that right? Yes. Well, I had a PhD in chemistry. Um, and then RMC is a military establishment. And when I was there one day, the dean and the head of chemistry, Colonel Sawyer, he called me into his office and he said, Louis, we have an establishment for five full professors, period. None of them are very old, and it's going to be a long time before you're advancing up the ranks. But the head of chemical engineering is going to be leaving, and if you go off and do some chemical engineering, you can come back as head of chemical engineering. So I got in touch with a number of schools at the United States, Stanford, Yale, Harvard, so forth, and I got a lot of offers. And I was sitting there one day wondering, am I going to go to Stanford? Am I going to go to where? And the head of chemical engineering of Texas phoned me up and he said, well, what are you thinking? You know, we've offered you uh, admittance to study chemical engineering, just engineering. And I said, well, I'm thinking about this school. And he said, oh, no, you don't want to go there. They're not accredited. <laughs> and so I thought, He's the only one who got in touch with me. I'm going to go to the University of Texas. Now, there was a big advantage there because the University of Texas has an 18 week term, an 18 week term, and a 12 week term. So you can go to school all year, whereas we have 13, 13 week terms, something like that. And so I was able to, in um, just under three years, I think it was three. Six, seven, seven semesters, something like that. I went through a master's degree in chemical engineering. And then I was all set, you know, to come back. And uh, then my mother said, come back to RMC. And then my mother said, well, you're, you're, you're going to be in New Jersey or something for uh, where I'm giving a talk and they're thinking of offering me a job. 
why don't you come up to our group? And some friends of yours, Ken Fryer and Arthur Beaumont are there. So I came to one of them, I said, my mother, looked up Ken and Arthur Beaumont, and they said, could you stay and talk to the dean? Sure. And so I talked to the dean, and then he said, could you stay and talk to the president? <laughs> Mr. Dr. Hagee. Hagee, right. And so I talked to them, and they ended up offering me a job. Well, I've got so many jobs, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so that's how I came to Waterloo. Well, we're very lucky for, for that. Well, I was very <laughs> lucky too. In, um, in your um, time, you know, as, as a professor, you did get involved a lot with the development of the chemical engineering curriculum in its early stages. Well, yes, uh, I can remember when they started in 1957, the school was set up on academic quarters. Well, now, first of all, that's a lot of moving back and forth. You know, you're, you're in school for just a few weeks, and then you go up, have a job, and then you're back. And it doesn't fit with any of the other universities in terms of transfers in or out. And so I was involved in changing it to two, two, uh, three semesters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember having all these cards on the wall in my office where I was figuring out how the program would change for all the different departments. So that was my involvement. There is a circulating rumor that uh, you invented or had something to do with the so-called line calculation protocol. Is that, is that rumor true? Uh, I, t I didn't invent it. Um, they used that at the University of Texas, and I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, the author of that textbook. Himmelbach. David Himmelbach. Yes. Well, when I went to Texas, um, I had a research fellowship, and I was working with David Himmelbach, and we were working on liquid diffusion. Exactly, and, and uh, the line calculation is big in his textbook. And oh, that's in the, yeah, and so that's something that I taught them very early. Yes, this is this carries the day even today for uh, for chemical engineering. Yes. Now, if I have a thousand milligrams of something, can you tell me how many tons I have? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. It's very systematic. Indeed it is. You also served as director of admission for the Faculty of Engineering, and, and there, you, you earn reputation as director for being Okay, now let me tell you the story. I think this was when I was associate chairman. The phone rang one day, and it was a father. And he was saying, you know, my son applied for chemical engineering. He has an average of 80, and you turned him down. Well. What could I say? I said, you know, we had a lot of applicants, and there were a lot of applicants over 80. So we had to leave it at that. But the next day, the principal phoned, and it was the same story. And I told him what I told the father, and he said, ah, but my school has higher standards. Well, I didn't have much to say about that. I went and talked to the dean, and I told him about this story, and I said, why don't we keep track of the marks that we have, which are not final marks when we admit a student, but intro marks. Why don't we take those, and we compare them, not with, you know, we have final exams after 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Don't compare them with 1A, where they're settling down. Compare them with 1B. So a student comes in with 80, and in 1B has 65, there's minus 15 for that school for that year. And I talked to Ralph Stanton, and he thought it was a good idea. And so Matt did it. Mm -hmm. And so I can't remember, I don't know what it is now, I don't even know if they're still using it. But when the students came into engineering in the first week, they wrote an exam on math. Math preparedness test. We still have that. Oh, yeah. 
and, and, and we just adjusted the program, I think. If, if you're an electrical engineer, you can drop chemistry and pick it up as a correspondence course. And so all of those things came together. And I don't know what the failure rate is now, but it's nowhere near 35%. No, no. So no. that was a great satisfaction. Indeed it was. Oh, another thing that, that we did was, that I did, was different when, when I was admissions officer. In Quebec, students go to grade 11, and that's the end of high school, and then they go to what's called a SEJA. Mm -hmm. And at a SEJA, you can prepare for university, or you can become a mechanic or an electrician. We never took students from grade 11 because they didn't have the background. But one day, a couple of students came to Waterloo to see me, and they were in grade 11. And they said, we'd like to come to Waterloo. I said, well, I don't think you've got enough mathematics. So what we did for those two students, that we had enough time ahead of time, was they took, you know, Waterloo is a very extensive correspondence program. And they took a course in linear algebra and calculus, I think. And I admitted both of them from grade 11. And they did very well in mechanical engineering. Excellent. Straight from grade 11. And one more I can think of. I had a man who was about 30. And he was working in a factory. And he came to the university to see me. And he said, you know, I'd like to do mechanical engineering but I've only got grade 10. I set up a program for him on correspondence courses. It took him maybe a little over a year, and he came into mechanical engineering, and he did very well. So grade 10 to university. Well, that's unconventional. So that's, yes, well, Waterloo was unconventional. I just gave you two good examples. <laughs> now, I'm going to turn, you know, to a question that is very close, very, very close to chemical engineering. Industrial skill distillation, fundamental you know, to chemical engineering. Our department has always had an excellent pilot skill system. We still have the original one, but rumor has it, we had some run-ins with the Liquor Licensing Board of Ontario about it. I don't remember that, but I do think now this is very vague, of course, that maybe when they were distilling ethyl alcohol, mm -hmm. they may have lost some in the process. But I don't think they ever got into trouble. Even the distillation column has an unorthodox story behind it. The following is an excerpt from the history of the Department of Chemical Engineering. On the day that the students were erecting the new distillation tower, a photographer from the Globe and Mail newspaper was on campus, capturing the excitement of the new university. On May 2nd, 1961, the newspaper featured a photo of fourth year chemical engineering students working on the distillation tower. It was captioned, innocently enough, distillers. The next day, the president's office received a call from the Liquor Control Board of Ontario to advise that the university could not operate this equipment without a license. The distillation column, as it happens, can also be used to make moonshine. Once each term, chemical engineering ordered about 40 gallons of what was known as Alcool from the Seagram's warehouse in Waterloo. Alcool was also sold by the Liquor Control Board of Ontario as a cheap substitute for vodka. So it would seem that the folks at the Liquor Control Board knew a thing or two about human nature. It turns out that the students, being engineers, were using the sampling tap on the top plate to withdraw large samples to use as party fuel in various concoctions. What, do you, what thoughts do you have about um, chemical engineering for in the future? Things have changed, and, and there is a lot of um, a lot of conversation um, about uh, sustainability, about about um, ways uh, ways to uh, to do more recycling, ways to do to do production of uh, of chemicals in more sustainable ways. 
recycling is one of the things that I'm fanatic about. You, you're pointing at. Uh, I'll show you this. Oh. Now, these are the top of soya milk containers. They, indeed, they are. Let me let me let me show it. Ah. And oh, wow. Wow. I save and separate all of my plastics, and I put them up in bags so that. You know, I don't mix them all up. One kind of plastic I put in, another kind of plastic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture of me with them winding around my neck and do something about trying to get people involved because we're drowning in plastic. Yes, we are. So well, you know, it's pretty clear to, to most people that we have to uh, figure out ways to make... Uh, Plastic, you know, in a more sustainable and fashion. Not, and recycle. not throw it into the exactly. landfill. Exactly. This is anyway, it's going to be a, quite interesting. In fact, this will have <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, I have to thank you for uh, for all you've told me. Is there anything else you would like to talk about? I believed in a lot of exams, uh, but you have to have a carrot. And so, if I had a course, I might have three or four. Three hour exams, usually scheduled at night so it didn't interfere with the day. Now here's the carrot. Johnny, you're going to write four exams in this course. You can drop one of them. And so if you've got an A average, you forget about the final. But the interesting thing is, I had a lot of what students with a averages and they'd still go right to fun. Encourage them, don't try and reduce the stress. That reduces it. Yeah. If everything is on that final exam, my God. But here you go to the final exam and hey, I got it made. Mm -hmm. More assessments, lower stake. Yep. Yes. yes. So this uh, this is something that's been uh, practiced a lot nowadays. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Thank you so much again for having us and Thank for, you. The, for the opportunity.